Uh, if you didn't already know, you're in building cooperative APIs with HTTP2. Uh, I wanted to quickly just shout, give a shout out for decoupled Drupal days. Uh, it's going to be in New York City on August 17th uh, through 19th. Uh, it's a great place to come, uh, share experiences about building decoupled sites, learn from one another, um, ask questions, voice concerns, uh, just collaborate on some really cool and awesome stuff that's pushing the boundaries of what Drupal can do, um, kind of bringing us into the future of what we can do with JavaScript and with Drupal. Um, yeah, so try and make it um, decoupled Drupal days. I'm Gabe Solis. I'm a senior engineer at Acquia, uh, JSON API co-maintainer. I really love HTTP2. I really love like reading specifications, RFCs, um, and I, I do lose sleep over, sleep over APIs. Uh, to figure out like how we're going to build cooperative HTTP APIs with um, HTTP2, we kind of have to understand where we're coming from and some of the concepts that are underneath HTTP, so therefore why HTTP2 is different than HTTP1, and then also some just basic concepts about how we build APIs in general and how they work, how client and server can work together. Um, at the lowest level, that's as low as we're gonna go, it's IP or the internet protocol, um, and it's very dumb system. It's just you've got two nodes, two computer systems communicating with one another, sending data back and forth. Uh, between a source and a host, and they find each other on the, on the big wide open internet with IP addresses. Uh, very raw, just bits sent over the wire. Uh, so the internet protocol describes how those two systems can communicate. And then on top of that, people have what's called TCP, and that's the transport control protocol. And TCP is um, a way, a mechanism for communicating over IP, uh, but it adds specific features to IP that make it a little bit um, easier to use, right? So it's reliable, ordered, and air-checked. Uh, reliable meaning if I send a raw packet of data over the wire, uh, I can be sure that it's going to end up in the client. There's not, I don't have to account for some packets of information not arriving, right? Or just missing packets altogether. Ordered makes it easier to understand because if I send like a bunch of JSON over the wire, uh, that first half is going to get there first, and the second half is going to get there second. Because um, there are lots of different ways that that data could go over the big open internet. Um, and so they might arrive out of order, but TCP means I can be sure that they'll be there in the order I sent them. And then error checked just means nothing got corrupted along the way. Um, and so HTTP then builds on top of that protocol. And HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Um, and there's one distinct feature for what we've seen so far about protocols and that it's an application protocol. So it means it's actually for being applied to real systems that you're gonna build. It, it starts to get into uh, actually how to, how to build things that are, are what we consider applications, right? Uh, rather than just infrastructure underneath. Uh, and another thing to call out is hypermedia and that's gonna be really important later uh, because HTTP is intimately intertwined with the idea of hypermedia. It's kind of what makes the internet over IP the web, right? The World Wide Web, that's hypermedia. Um, so what is HTTP 1? What is what we've been using for over 20 years? Um, and we all just kind of take it for granted, but really underneath the hood, just a quick reminder, we're gonna look at kind of how it's put together. So at the highest level, there's a few basic concepts. That's URIs, methods, and messages. Um, a URI, it's a uniform resource identifier. Um, we typically always see it as URL. It doesn't necessarily need to be one. What makes a URL different is that it's locatable, and that kind of means like if I have example.com, I can use DNS to find out that I'm supposed to go to 192.168, blah, blah, blah. Um, but you could have a uniform resource identifier that doesn't have a DNS resolution. It, it's not that important. Um, but then we see it as like this HTTP example.com, API user one. It's a uniform, unique identifier for the user with ID one. That's where the user is, okay? Um, breaking it down, there's scheme, host, port, um, path, and query. That's just the basic components of it. Um, and so then HTTP has the concept of methods, right? And you've maybe seen these before if you've built APIs or if you've worked with REST, those are get, passed, post, patch, put, and delete. 
There are others, um, but what they do is they describe actions between, between the client and the server, things that you want to change, right? Um, there are a couple others, head options, trace, connect, um, but they're really more about discovery. They're not about applications. Uh, options kind of says, what am I allowed to do? Git says, get me the resource at a particular URI. Post says, create an info a resource at this URI. So maybe add a new user. Pass, post, patch, put, delete. All different variations of that idea. Um, and then statuses are kind of from the other side. So if you've got a client and a server working together, methods are what the client sends and statuses are what the server sends back. Um, and so they categorize basically errors or information. They categorize that communication between the client and the server. Um, 200 level errors, they basically say, I understood the message that you sent me. Um, I did what you expected me to do. We're all good. Um, and then there, there are subcategories in there, like 202, 201, 204. But they're all basically saying, I understood, and we're good to go. Uh, 300 level errors, they say, like, I understand what you're asking for, client, but maybe you, you actually meant this. Uh, you should be talking to a different resource. 400, it's just like, uh, client, you're, you're drunk, go home. Um, <laughs> it's a bad request. It's a, the client's fault. And 500 is kind of like, it's not you, it's me. I'm sorry. I, whatever you did was OK, but I, I really screwed up, you know? Um, and so we talked about that idea that there's a client and server, and they're sending messages back and forth. And so that's the, the fundamental idea of HTTP, is that you have requests and responses. Uh, and they're, they basically start with a line. They're composed of a URI, method status, headers, which are meta information about the message, and the body, so what's actually there. Uh, and then headers, like I said, describe the resource. Uh, let's see. Uh, my arrows key just stopped working. There we go. Uh, so for an example, uh, an HTTP request or a response, it's going to say content type might be the header, and it's text HTML, and then of course the body follows, and that kind of tells the client how to interpret the information that's being sent. It's, don't try and parse this as JSON, parse it as HTML. Alternatively, it could say it's JSON, and so then you wouldn't be looking for angle brackets in HTML, you're looking for JSON. Um, so that's, that's part of cooperation between the client and server there. Uh, just looking at a request, it could be very simple with no content in it. Uh, you say git, you know, give me the, the user one, and then the response all put together here you see the 200 OK, blah, blah, blah. Um, so then on top of that, right, we start building APIs and we start talking about REST. And that's kind of like the lingua franca for APIs um, built on top of HTTP. Uh, and what does that stand for? Sometimes we just hear like something is RESTful, right? And you might think like, OK, that means it's going to be in JSON and it's probably going to be some different uh, URLs that are going to be generally structured like some type, like a user or an article or something, slash ID. And I, and I know I can, sh I can share those between a client and a server. Um, REST stands for representational state transfer. Uh, and it's important to understand that it's really about moving state back and forth between the client and server. It's not about performing actions. It's not about uh, behavior changes. So uh, if you're familiar with Drupal, like you can't clear cache in a restful way because you're just you're telling Drupal to do something, but you're not transferring state back and forth, right? Um, and so REST is not actually a protocol. We've been talking about IP, TCP, um, HTTP. REST isn't a protocol. Really, it's just kind of like a, a style of, of building things on top of that application layer, that HTTP. Um, so it's just principles about how you might construct an application. And it's totally, it's always HTTP. So what are those principles? Um, they seem rather obvious, uh, but they end up having really like huge ramifications for how you design a system that allow to a client and a server to, to evolve over time and be really robust and to develop independently of one another. So if a server needs to change out its database and you know switch from MySQL to Postgres, it can do that. Or, if you need to go from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, 
uh, and still keep operating, you can upgrade that without necessarily updating like a JavaScript client. Um, that's kind of the, the promise of decoupled. Uh, because it, what that client and server does is it, it creates a separation of concerns, right? The client is going to handle presentation of the data, and the server is going to stand handle storage and maybe some business logic, like what to do when a new user is created. Maybe you need to send an email or something like that. Um, so if you've been hearing about decoupled sites, that comes from this idea of, of RESTful systems being client and server. Well, they, they influence one another, rather. Stateless is the idea that that HTTP request and response have to be independent from one another, right? If you send two or three requests, uh, they can't affect each other in any, in any way, right? So uh, the way you might think about this is if I send a request and I say get um, you know, some, some resource and I get a, a 403 back, it's denied to me. I don't have permission to, to view that resource. And then I go to a login page and I, I do some login there. And then I go back and I tr retry the same request. If I didn't change anything about that first request, it should still be denied, right? It, it shouldn't be that I, that I made the login call. I actually have to change something about the request. So that might mean putting a cookie header on there or an authorization header. That's what makes it self-contained. It's independent of one another. Um, and then cacheability is the idea that your resources, the representations that come for it, have to share information about if they can be stored for any given period of time. So if you've got a CDN, how long can it, can it cache this response? Or if you're trying to build an offline app, how long is, is this resource valid or something like that? Um, and the reason you want things to be cacheable are so you can eliminate requests and responses altogether because that always has a cost, right? If you make a request to a server, even though it's, it's really fast over fiber optic cable, you know, you're never going to really get it under 100 milliseconds if you're going between the US and Europe. Uh, just unavoidable physics. There's time that it takes to make those two, that cycle of a request and a response. So if it's cacheable, you can kind of eliminate those requests altogether or maybe cache something on the edge and make that latency lower. Uh, layered system is that if, you, if a system is restful, uh, it should be able to have layers put in between, uh, like proxies or load balancers or CDNs, and nobody should be the wiser. The, the server that's generating the actual resource and the client, they don't need to know that something was in between them. Uh, code on demand is kind of an under underrepresented, or people don't really think of it very much, but it is part of REST, and it's optional. Um, but it means that you can actually send code in a RESTful way that tells the, the client how to understand a resource. Um, you might think about that in terms of like uh, doing client-side validation. If you, if you wanted to send a, a schema for a user, and you wanted to be able to say certain rules, like you can't have these combinations of fields or something, you might be able to ship some JavaScript over there that can run that validation. Um, it's kind of, it, it came about for making like Java applets and stuff, but um, it kind of fell out of favor. And then uniform interface, I promise we're wrapping this stuff about REST up. Um, it's that, kind of like what I was saying, you could switch between Postgres and MySQL. Representations are decoupled from their storage. Um, and so when, you, when you're operating over, over a RESTful API, you, you're not just like sending a, a SQL query. You're not saying, like, if, I'm, if I want to post a user, you don't actually put in your request, like, insert into table you know, values. You're, you're, you're not having to worry about the actual implementation details. So it allows you to build things in decoupled teams and, and version things and, and progress forward. Um, and then, of course, there's the idea that you use hypermedia to communicate state, okay? So hypermedia is this idea is linking, um, and that's how you can, you can make, change, re represent the state on the server and the client, um, and we'll look at that later, but um, like if, you, if you're getting a collection of resources and you want to know, is there another page, right? You don't necessarily have to say, there are five pages for a listing, you just put a link in there to the next one, and that communicates the self, the fact that there's a link there, that there is a next page. Um, so hypermedia kind of sounds a little fancy, 
but it's really a, quite a simple concept. If we just think about text that's not hypertext, uh, it's just like this, right? It's I'm a teapot, short and stout. And all of a sudden, we've made it hypertext, okay? All we did is we added a link to text, and that link is saying this, this bit of content uh, can reach out and it, it's referencing something else. It makes, it adds information to just a, something uh, simpler. And hypermedia, it's just the difference between saying hypertext or hyperjson or hyperxml. Hypermedia uh, uh, encompasses them all. Um, and so you can have, you can have links in JSON um, and they can be represented in different ways, but the idea is those, uh, those links can exist, okay? Um, and so, you know, you can have the same exact representation in JSON as, as you do here. You know, you, you've got the, the line of text and then something else that it references. JSON, you have the, the same content and then a link out to its explanation. And that hypermedia creates kind of the web as we know it. You can think of everything on the web as, as these nodes with lines in between them, edges in a graph. Um, and they, they create this, this web of information that inform one another, but also describe um, the relationships between different resources. So uh, the relationship between a listing of users and a particular user. Uh, so thinking about a very traditional website, you might have the, very, the home page. It lives at index.html, and so a client might go and request that. It downloads the HTML, and it notices that there's an image tag with a link, a source, right, to a hero, and the browser's gonna download that. It's gonna notice that there's a style.css, and it's gonna grab that, and then when it gets the style of CSS, it's gonna see that there are probably icons in that CSS as well, or fonts or things like that, and it, it it makes up the whole page. It's a, a big graph or tree of, of information uh, that, that has to be fetched to, to represent that thing, that home page resource, all at once. Um, but those hypermedia links don't just make up a single page, they can represent whole applications. So if you think about a website in general, not just the home page, there can be the home page that links to an about page, that also links to a post page, and that post page also links to uh, individual posts, and so not just one page, but a whole suite of, a whole application lives under that, that idea of linked hypermedia. Uh, then we see something that's a little bit more restful, right? It's posts, post two, post one, and those posts might reference tags or something on them, and it makes up that graph. Um, so if you're, if you're an API client or something, you're, you're getting posts, and then you want to learn more about the second post, you might traverse that link, download that other data, and of course the graph then, um, then changes so that uh, now that you're at post two, where previously we were at just posts at the head of that graph, the, what you can see changes. So now you've got tags and author, tags one, and that graph is always expanding out in front of you as you move along, right? Uh, so in HTTP 1, how do, we, how do we understand this whole graph at once? Um, we have to um, make requests, right? So we, get a, we send a git request for index.html, we send gits for heroes and styles. Um, and so what is the actual order of operations when we send those request responses? We first get index.html, and then we have to download that HTML and we notice, okay, there's some style.css, this is parching the, let's go get that. Then we're gonna go get the hero image, and then of course, we finally, we've received the style, and so now we see we gotta get the separator, and we gotta get the list bullet. And so of course, that's really slow. You, you make these requests, and they're sequentially operated, and so to download a whole page with maybe hundreds of resources, that can take a lot of time, because you just have to do one after the other after the other. And so people started trying to optimize that, that system. Um, and so browsers basically looked at TCP, and they looked at HTTP, and they said, okay, uh, how can we make this a little bit faster? First we'll get the HTML, but then we're just gonna open up two TCP connections and we'll do it at the, the same time. Um, and we'll ask for the style and the hero at relatively the same, the same time. And that makes everything a little bit faster. We download the styles and then we ask for those icons um, as soon as we have the CSS. And of course it starts to get optimized. We're, we're bringing that waterfall down. It's become faster and faster. Um, and so that encouraged people to do, do strange things like 
well, we still don't want to make multiple requests for all the icons. Let's put them all into one, one big bucket and download the whole thing at once. Uh, and HTTP2 kind of said, well, maybe we don't need to have this big waterfall of content. When somebody asks for the index.html, let's just send them everything at once. So HTTP2 introduced this idea of server push. And that's the big thing that is supposed to make it so much more performant. And the idea is you get that index.html and the server already knows you're going to ask for the style.css and the hero image and all the icons and so it can just send it to you all at once. Um, and so people have been saying, okay, this overthrows that idea of maybe doing spriting with your icons or um, using link preloaders, prefetchers and all this kind of stuff. But that, that of course like introduces this idea of um, the server is kind of saying that you, forcing you to download things that you may not need. Uh, and so that's, that's the goal, right? We're, we're trying to get that waterfall smaller and smaller. Okay, so we've talked about HTTP 1, we've talked about REST, we've talked about these basic principles. Um, and now I kind of want to talk about cooperation and what allows clients and servers to cooperate. Uh, and that's through specifications. Uh, specifications impart meaning to, to a lower level protocol. So HTTP imparted meaning to TCP. It says, if I send a, a, a request, a packet of information, and it has the word git in the top, it means you're supposed to give me something, right? Two, 200 statuses mean um, it worked. Headers describe the body, blah, blah, blah. Specifications allow Three minutes? Okay. Um, wow, all right. <laughs> uh, all right, so schema lets you understand the data types that are there, and HADOS links let you say, like, are there more pages? Can I delete this? Does this cart um, have products? Um, can I make a withdrawal? If a link that exists there to withdraw content or withdraw information, make a withdrawal, that link shouldn't exist if the bank account is empty. Uh, so we can look at like a JSON, can everybody read this? Cool. Um, we look at a, a document that might be at like APA slash content, and we see that the next link is there, so there must be more pages. Um, create is here, there's a link there, so we must be allowed to create content. Uh, I'm just gonna skip very far ahead. Um, so let's say you're, you're an API thing and you wanna, you, basically a server can't push all the information you need. It doesn't know what the client needs. If you're in a decoupled world, it doesn't know that if you're, if you're load, look at loading a certain post that you also need the comments. And if you're, if you're a decoupled client, you might be getting a certain post and say, I don't know, it's just like a teaser list. You don't need the comments, but then as soon as you navigate to the page itself, those comments need to be there. So a server can't push in a RESTful world that content along without some other extra cooperation. Same goes for pages. As you get secondary pages and then comments for other items, you don't know what you need. Um, so you still end up in that waterfall system where you're, you're making these waterfall of requests. Uh, so basically the way that we can solve that is we can communicate exactly what we need. If I'm a, if I'm a client, I, know, I may need, know that I need all the posts, uh, but I don't know how many to get. If, uh, if I need the schema for a post, uh, I don't know if it's up to date. If I'm a server, I know that there are maybe 150 posts, but I don't know how many the client wants. Maybe they're just doing a listing of the top five. Uh, so basically what I was, well, what I was hoping to, to show was that we can communicate using this idea of hypermedia hyperlinks in, in text, and we can send a header that says, when you respond to me, um, we look at the bottom of the 200 okay, if I go to slash API and I get a response, and it comes back with links like uh, API content, that's a listing of content, I can specify a path in that content that says, I want you to push something to me, please, right? So if we look at that top one, it says links content href, we can follow that in, and then the server knows that API slash content ought to be pushed, right? Um, and then it, you'll see that second push please inside the JSON, it says, in that thing that you're going to push to me, also push to me uh, the next page, and also push to me 
the data comments that are related to it and link those as well. And you can say, like, I want 100 of them, no matter how many items are there per page, give me up to 100 of them. And the server can just keep pushing those things. Um, so I'll just quickly do a very uh, quick demo. Um, press escape. So this idea that you have this waterfall here is uh, we click HTTP 1, and you're kind of noticing that waterfall. There are five items per page there, and they come in one by one by one. And if we were to look at the, uh, well, the HTTP 2 example, uh, hopefully they all load uh, relatively much faster once they get there. I'm sorry, I, I really messed up the time. I thought I had a, a much longer amount of time. <laughs> uh, do you guys want to see the, the waterfall, or should I just wrap it up? Okay. Yeah, my slides are available. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the hint. Uh, my slides are available on, on the website. Uh, I'll put all these up. And also, there's a GitHub repo that shows uh, a proxy that you can put in front of any JSON API server, and it'll start doing these pushes for you. Uh, I wrote an HTTP client to do this kind of stuff, and all the code for the demo is up on GitHub as well, and I'll link all that. Thanks, guys. I'm sorry. Thank you.